Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and we're honored to have with us today Trillia Newbell. Uh, Trillia is Acquisitions Director at Moody Publishers and a prolific author and speaker. She's a contributor to The Faithful Project and has written several books, including A Great Cloud of Witnesses, A Study of Those Who Lived by Faith, and Fear and Faith, Finding the Peace Your Heart Craves. But before we hear from Trillia, let's go to Ed Stesser, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and Executive Director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. And we're big fans here of Trillia. Actually, I have a Moody radio show, so whenever I have someone from Moody on, I want to say, part of the Moody family, but you know, the podcast is not in that Moody family, but <laughs> we're in the Moody family. You're not, but Trillia and I are in the Moody family, so we welcome you. We It's, it's, it's whosoever you. will, whosoever <laughs> will come. It's kind of our approach. Um, but we're those of you who followed Trillia's writing and speaking have seen that if you kind of uh, bring a, a thread through much of it, it really has a lot that's helpful to the moment we're in. It's a complicated time. It's a difficult time. Uh, people feel divided. People feel fearful. So I want to encourage you to engage this conversation with us. And if you're enjoying our interviews, it would help us if you left a review. So again, we're going to talk through some of the emphases uh, and actually tie in some of the books that you've written, truly as well. One of them is Fear and Faith, Finding the Peace Your Heart Craves. And, you know, that was written a few years ago. And But tell us a little about your experience with fear and how how, how God helped you to live in his peace. And, and then we're going to talk about how it relates to church leaders. Tell us about that. Yeah, I don't even know where to start because I feel like a part of the one of the first things that the Lord revealed as I um, when I professed faith in him and gave my life to him is that I struggle with fear from fear of man, which I have uh, not overcome, but I, I know how to fight now to fear of danger and tragedy to fear of you name it. I have struggled with fear. And so it's something that has been um, in, not ingrained, but something I've had to battle my whole Christian walk. Yeah, so and that book was uh, 2015, and um, the world wasn't beset by fear. I mean, I guess people, there are places for me, for you, for all of us, uh, but fear has become kind of defining reality. I, I, I was preaching this week, and I said, you know, some people are afraid of the pandemic. Some people are afraid that people are too afraid of the pandemic. I mean, there's always some variation. So you were very personal in the book. Again, it's 2015, so it's seven years later. Um, we've all learned a lot about fear. We've, we walked through crisis and controversy. How do pastors and church leaders respond to the various fears that they deal with? Yeah, well, and speaking of fears that they deal with, that I've seen quite a bit is a fear that their congregations are going to all leave. So maybe they won't speak um, different truth and love or a fear that... Um, they're not going to have the, the the support that they need financially. I have seen a lot of church leaders c- concerned that they're going to lose their whole ministry. And we've seen that reality. We've seen yeah. those things play out. Yeah. So some of those fears, um, they, they they shouldn't fear, but they they aren't unwarranted. We see we see what's happening. And so for church leaders, one, I, I do believe that sh- you've got to be saturated in the word of God. Um, I don't remember the statistic, but over 300 something fear knots in the Bible. Um, So God has a word to say about fear, but also I I really love, and I believe it's Philippians four, and I should have this memory memorized, but it's something like, let your reasonableness be known to all. The Lord is at hand. And so if we're leading people, we need to, and we should be, the most reasonable people, because we have God, Jesus on our side, and we can rest, we can rest, we can trust him. And that to me has been, when I look at now, today, I just see a lot of um, unreasonableness in our responses, unreasonableness in our thinking and not submitting all of these things to the Lord. You know, truly, a lot of times, um, pastors and church leaders they fear uh, they feel fear in their body, and so it's a response to what they're actually feeling. 
and then they lead their congregation that way. Um, what do you advise? I mean, what are your thoughts around pastors and helping to maybe talk down that fear in order so that they can lead their congregation well? You know, that's really interesting um, because <laughs> I will say at the beginning of the pandemic uh, in 2020, one of the things that surprised me and shocked me is how anxious I got. And I I have never felt that sort of anxiety and in my body where I felt like my throat was closing and I I couldn't think straight. <laughs> and it and I didn't quite know what was going on. But um very soon I realized if I breathe deeply, if I reminded myself of the truth, then I would be able to relax myself. I can give people those kind of exercises, but maybe they need to see a counselor. Yeah. Maybe they need to talk to someone else and especially leaders. Leaders are trying to juggle so much and care for people. There's a lot of output, but and it and it can be hard, I think, to receive and to get help. But if you are, and especially in this tumultuous time where everything seems to be heightened and intense, I would just really encourage seek help. Maybe it's a counselor and get rest. I know that that's, I could say, and I still do also believe, read the Bible, pray, ask God for help. That's where we're going to ultimately receive help. But practically speaking, I think rest and getting counseling would serve so many leaders right, right. now who tend to do things in their own strength. Yeah, no, totally. And I'm, I'm tracking with you 100%. Um, and exhort people in that same direction. Just this, yes. our, worship, our worship leader at church just casually mentioned, I think it was two weeks ago, I was preaching somewhere else Sunday, he casually mentioned that when I was talking to my counselor, and I think normalizing that's a good thing, and sermons break stigmas talking about that, but pastors, more of a barrier for pastors and church leaders as well. So 100% affirming. Let me, so I, I, when I think back to my younger years, I would say for five years in my life, our church was growing, things were going well, but at the same time, growing, there's always growing pains. And I got to the place that when the phone rang, I was like, oh no, who's calling and what's the problem? Oh no, who's calling, what's the problem? And and then on Saturday, I'd be like, oh man, I'm afraid we're not gonna have more people this Sunday than we had last Sunday. I always was driven by having more people because we were planning this church and more. So, you know, and I, and I think I could have used some counseling at that time, <laughs> but at the same time, I just could have used some wiser approaches to dealing with some of the anxiety that's there. So so agreeing 100% on counseling, what are some wiser approaches just to addressing some of those fear issues that enable us to push through and not be so driven by them? Yeah, so you could take captive your thoughts. Um, most of the things that we, I think, think and and are, are lies, they're not, they're not true. Um, they're either assumptions about people or assumptions about um, the future, what's going to happen. That, that's where fear comes from. It's unbelief. It's not believing that God is who he says he is. So we want to take captive our thoughts and replace them with truth. Okay, what does God say in his word about, he says that he will never leave or forsake. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. He's going to provide for the lilies. He'll provide for you. So those are some things I say, take captive your thoughts, replace them with truth other practical things is to seek help i i and it, maybe it's not a counselor maybe it's a pat another pastor right. that can right. al help alleviate some of these fears people who know who've experienced um whatever it is that you're dealing with you you don't have to do it alone i think a lot of leaders try to do everything alone and we need we also you also need a community so whether you're and and i'm speaking of not just church as in um not just pastors but leaders in general they need a community so i i think isolation is is a danger so seek community um and then some other practical things is is really simple and this just, again, sounds maybe even cliche. Take one thing at a time rather than trying to. You're not God. Only God can handle all things. So I would suggest taking the one thing that you can work on right now and doing the one thing. Now, these these are going to they, they may not take all of your fear away, but they do take some of the pressure and mm -hmm which I think a lot of our anxiety and fear and is because of this pressure. So pressure and unbelief 
hinder us from um, acting in a way that sometimes is 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 reasonable or best for um, our congregations or our people around us. Yeah, you know, that gets me thinking about like where I go when I have fear, and I, I love to hear from you, Chilia, like which places in the Bible you go to when you have fear. Like for me, one of the big stories is is Jonathan, right? And so his father Saul is living in fear. He hides in a cave, and Jonathan's like, "No, we got to go. We got to go fight the Philistines." And mm-hmm. And he goes and they win a small battle and it summons like the other uh, Israelites to come out of, you know, the hiding. And mm-hmm. so, you know, coming back to scripture, like that, I think that's a huge point that you made. Like, I'd be interested, like, where do you go in scripture whenever you feel that anxiety? You know, it's interesting, but I actually go to places like Romans 8 and think of all the promises in that, that one chapter, um, knowing that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I will not be condemned for my fear that I can confess my sin and he is faithful and just to forgive me for Psalm 1, 9, but I don't have to be condemned. And then to remind myself that all of my, because a lot of my fear is about suffering and, and tragedy. All of all of it is temporary and, it, and it's going to, it has an expiration date, all of our suffering and pain and sorrow. And so reminding myself of that that the temporal nature of suffering. And then knowing, and this is all in Romans 8, that when I can't pray, when or when I don't have the words to say, the spirit is interceding for me. And then to remind myself that he's working all things together for the good of those who love him. So it's a good reminder, especially when we think everything is going to, you know, in a handbasket. <laughs> he's working together, everything together for the good of those who love him. So we don't have to, he's not wringing his hands, so neither do we. And then of course, to remind ourselves that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, nothing. And that to me is is such a helpful text, like the whole Romans eight. And then remind myself that Jesus says to us in John, I can't remember this text exactly, but that um, in, in the world, we're gonna have trouble. But he's overcome the world. So we don't have to, we again, wring our hands. We're, we don't have to be surprised by trouble, as First Peter says, but we trouble's going to be here, but we don't have to worry. And then to know that we follow Jesus, a man of sorrows, who understands he's acquainted with every single bit of our grief. He's acquainted with fear. He knows it. He bore it. And so again, we we get to go before a throne of grace in our time of need to receive mercy and to receive help. And mm-hmm. so there's lots, all of that with scripture and, and lots of it points to Jesus. So when I'm anxious or, or fearful, I look to my savior who's, who gets it. He understands, he doesn't condemn me. He doesn't shame me. And I, I seek seek his face. <laughs> Lord, help me in this. Um, another place, and I would just encourage all of us to look, is, well, there's a good, there's so many, where, but the book of Psalms, I think, is just a great yeah. place to call out, recall, and you can you read them, pray them, sing them, and you can, you, you can relate to them. They're so honest, and it helps you know that you, too, can be honest before your God. Yeah, I was I was uh, preaching at Maranatha uh, Missionary Conference Center or something. I forget the exact title, but it's a kind of a well known thing in Michigan. And I chose to go through the Psalms. And what was fascinating was, you know, it's you know it's a camp, so you're supposed to be. It's I mean, I was talking to adults, and you're almost supposed to be like upbeat. And the Psalms are not like mm-hmm. all that super upbeat all the time, which is what I think ministered. There are a lot of pastors there because the reality is, I mean man, reading the psalm, the psalmist cry out to God, you know, yes. in lament and prayer. and But I think we keep coming back to a centered on something other than our ministry performance. Hmm. Uh, and maybe that's what the Lord has for some of our pastors and church listener, uh, leaders listening, is not focused on performance, the ministry. The cliche is we get so focused on the work of the Lord, we don't focus on the Lord of the work. Hmm. Um, but I think it matters. The, you went to several different places. I want to take you to Hebrews because you've actually written uh, a great cloud of witnesses, a study of those who lived by faith. Because Hebrews points to God's faithfulness, and uh, a really key issue in this is that it's not just based on our performance, God's faithfulness in the midst of that. So 
Um, what does Hebrews reveal to us about God's faithfulness that would help pastors and church leaders? Well, I think one of the things that it reveals to us is that it's not about us, which you kind of alluded to, but it re- really isn't. These men and women, they walked by faith and they're also, they're, it's kind of often called the Hall of Fame of Faith. But half of these people, if they walked right now, we would, our society, our current Christian culture would reject and shame them. They would have no chance of redemption. <laughs> hmm. They would be, ne- they would never return to any sort of a ministry. We, they would be done, gone. And because their lives didn't, they weren't all shining beacons of light and, and beauty. I, they struggled. And so that to me is is just a reminder that God is a keeping God. He's a covenant God. He's a faithful God. And it should give us a lot of courage to keep going because God is um, he's just not ashamed of us. Now, Mm -hmm. they also repented. They turned. They changed. So what I'm not saying is that they lived and stayed in their sin. (laughs) But so much of them were um, just had really tough, tough situations and and the tough situations that they were walking through, but tough, tough lives, their lives were not perfect and their faith was not often. Um, but there is one that I, I just, I have leaned, not leaned on is not the right word, but I've just been impressed by and Enoch have, have you all ever studied the lives of Enoch? You know, I think I think I did. I think I preached once on the life of Enoch, and that strange reference to him. In, well, anyway, talk to us about Enoch. Well, yeah. So he is mentioned, I believe, two, maybe three max in the scriptures, and Genesis five mentions him briefly, like one sentence, and then in Hebrews he's mentioned, and he lived a short life. He walked with God and never died. <laughs> but all he said, it's he's he is counted faithful. He walked with God. And one of the things that I love about the story is that his life was pretty obscure. And yet he was in this hall of fame of faith. He has one sentence in Genesis and we we were like, oh, this guy walked with God. And then he's mentioned as incredibly faithful, having pleased God. (laughs) And and so for a leader, I think that's an encouragement um, to keep doing the work of ministry to keep laboring because God sees he's a God who sees he see he saw Enoch he note he took note notice of him he took notice of his faithfulness to walk close in relationship with him and and he counted him as as part of this hall of fame of faith of we know Abraham and we know Sarah and we know David we know all of these these Moses but Enoch is so obscure. And so that to me is probably one of the, if for a leader, I would just encourage them to go and just take a look at that. And it's brief, um, but I, I hope in, that it'll encourage and inspire. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you just got me thinking about, you know, during the pandemic, a big um, a theme was resilience and perseverance. And I feel like coming out of the pandemic, courage is like that, that theme. Uh, and you outlined through Enoch's life so well. You know, I'd like to get a, how can you exhort the leader right now where they know that moving into this next ministry cycle, they've got to make some really difficult decisions. Um, and it might have something to do with downsizing staff or making big decisions. Like, how do they, how do they build courage um, as they move towards this next ministry season? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. This has been a theme, I think, of our short time together. Um you trust the Lord and trust it to the Lord. So it's leading and making hard decisions is not easy, but we do have to believe that we're stewarding, we're stewarding our ministry. So we need to steward it well. Um, we're shepherding people. So, and I don't shepherd people, but we shepherd people, well, except for my little kids, I guess, but we shepherd people. So we need to do that well. And so if you are, called to something you you whatever you do you want to do it to the glory of god and under his authority and trust him with it so we can't um yeah you you, you we can't control other people's responses um we can't 
we can't know the future, but we know that God is sovereign and we can trust him as we take steps of faith and encourage, make a decision and do the hard thing. Um, I, I, I think so often um, our problem is, and this kind of goes back to the fear topic, is that we don't know the outcome, we don't know the future. And wouldn't everything be, well, I don't know if everything would be easier if we knew that, <laughs> but we would think, we think it would be, but we can trust that God does. And so as we make these decisions and do those hard things, um, we have to lay it down before his feet and trust him with it. Another thing, real quick, and this is practical, please. that I do is I look backwards. Okay. God has never not been faithful to me. I, I look backwards at evidence. He's proven himself faithful. So when I look back and think, okay, wait a minute, I've 10 years ago, this or that happened and the Lord, he, he got me through, he saw me through it. Then I can entrust him with this decision that I have to make or whatever it is. Yeah, so faithful. Faithful is a term you actually are engaged and involved with faithful the collaboration of artists and authors telling the story of God's faithfulness uh, in and through women of the Bible. One of the things we're always, I'm always a little, I don't want, when I have women on the podcast or when I have someone who maybe have, a, let's say, a Latino person on the podcast, I don't just want to ask about Latino issues, um, but you have actually written, written and spoken on the importance um, uh, and seeing women in the scripture so that women can, uh, well, felt, be known, be known that they're seen and ultimately what that looks like. Um, for us as pastors and church leaders to elevate, to engage women leaders and more. So why why is that important? Um, what's some of the ways you've seen God uh, work through uh, some of the women of Scripture? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I'll start with why it's important. I mean, women, we're not just half the church. We're, we're more than half the church, but we are also just fellow disciples. So, you know, God's created us male and female and he's given us this body and we're a part of this body. We're a part of the mission. Um, and so to me, it's, it's peculiar and it's really interesting. This d massive divide male, female question, like the, it, it, I don't quite fully understand why women wouldn't be <laughs> not only encouraged, but deployed and, and gosh, acknowledged because we're, we're an absolutely important part of the church, of, of the mission of the church. Even, um, is it's Timothy, was it Eunice and, e Eunice and Lois who discipled and shared the gospel with them. And, and so we see Paul acknowledging so many women, I don't even know where to start. And then Jesus, um, he not only just revealing himself to women after his resurrection, but he had disciples and friends who were women. And and so I, I just find myself um, actually perplexed by the cult, current cultural. Yeah, we were kind of hoping, though, that you would not be perplexed, but you would give us clear answers to, because, I mean, it's kind of a thing. I mean, people are... You know, I mean, again, there's no theological tradition listening that can't empower and release women for ministry, significant ministry. Uh, people might differ on what that looks like, and I get that. And we have listeners from all different views, you know, theologically, traditions, polities. Um, but there still seems to be this this tension in so many places, which, which yeah. I, 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 and again, maybe at Wheaton, we just, you know, we at our School of Mission, Ministry, and Leadership, the majority of our students, higher than any other evangelical school, are women leaders um, because we invited them. To the training, so uh, what what are some steps we can get through the tension to let's acknowledge the blessing that the majority of the church brings and release and empower for ministry? Yeah, so I think one of the things is obviously we don't ignore our differences. I am very very much a proponent of celebrating our differences. Okay. However, with that said, I think acknowledging where 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 um, gifts are, acknowledging where leadership is, and then giving them the position. <laughs> Get, making sure that you're including um, rightfully where people, 
should be in within your theological framework, because every every person should be involved in the ministry of Christ. Every person should be involved in the mission. Um, and so, and I'm really grateful. We we talked about I'm I lead at Moody Publishers. I'm on the, on the leadership team, and I direct. I lead all of our acquirers, and it's never it has never occurred to me that um, I shouldn't be because I'm a woman, and it's never been said. And so, I'm and it, we we're just we're operating out of gifting and and entrusting. Um, that ministry work to the Lord. And so, so for me, I think it's acknowledging where people's gifts are and then making sure that there's a position for them. I think that's probably the biggest <laughs> hurdle for, especially in a church context. Um, I think within uh, parachurch organizations or ministries that you, you can, it's an easier um place to find where, where women are leading or women can be leaders. Um, but but that those are the things. See it and then a- acknowledge it and then find a place for them um, so that they know that they can be utilized. And everybody's needed. Every, every person's needed. No one should be, and I'm speaking in a church context now, no one should be sitting. We, we're all needed for this mission. And so um, whatever, it, and we don't all need titles. I do think that's important. And that's for men or women, <laughs> but we are all needed. And I think that's important. Yeah, truly, that's so good. And um, I, it just confirms you know, all the things that you speak and write about, uh, specifically around racial diversity, uh, women in leadership. And uh, yeah, as we land the conversation, I'd like to uh, maybe have you exhort uh, pastors who are moving into the future of their church, and they know they have to like make some of these hard decisions. And you know, and a lot of the fears is they don't want to tokenize somebody. You know, they don't want to make the wrong decision. Um, the flip side is they don't want to be accused of being woke, right? I mean, there's that whole um, tension there. So, how do you exhort pastors to move forward with courage to make these hard decisions? Uh, so that their church can be more equitable, and uh, so all women and men can can lead in mission towards the future. Fear God above all else. So fear God and not man. And if your heart is such that you are lovingly serving, that you are recognizing true gifting, you do not need to worry about someone calling you a name nor do you need to worry about tokenism. The only time that you are gonna token, to, tokenize someone is if you are there, if they are there just for their presence and not actually for who they are. And in other words, you are not truly acknowledging their gift and you are not asking them questions and they're not truly at the de- decision-making table. So evaluate your heart. If those things, if, if you are truly loving your neighbor, you are fearing the Lord, then you can walk in faith. That is my exhortation to you. Walk by faith. You may lose people. It will be worth it to stand before the Lord and say, I walked by faith. I did not, um, I did not give into the fear of man. I trusted you. I worship you. I don't worship man. I did what was best with the the information that I had for my congregation. And that is my um, encouragement to anyone. You're going to lose um, people, but you're you're not going to lose your soul. And I think that's of utmost importance. Amen. That's a good word. You've been listening to Trulia Newbell. You can learn more about her at trulianewbell.com. Thanks again for listening to the Sessor Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation helpful today, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review that'll help other ministry leaders find and benefit from our content. We'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.